afternoon, folks. This is Melody Hazel from the Healthcare Authority, and we will get started in just another minute or two. Um, so please stay tuned, um, and we will be having our first presenter uh, get going in just a minute. We're just waiting uh, to confirm everybody's on the line. So I'm doing a little bit of audio and visual testing. So please have patience with us, and we'll get started in just another minute. I am um, Governor Inslee's Senior Policy Advisor on Behavioral Health, Aging, and Disability. Um, I joined his office in March of this year, and prior to that, I was at the Attorney General's office and worked in their mental health unit. Um, so I'm just going to say a couple words. As, you, as all of you know, that there, the state is undergoing a major transformation in our behavioral health system right now. Um, I wanted to, I found a quote from Governor Inslee from last from 2018 that I thought was fitting in terms of his vision. Um, he said at that time, we are trying to provide 21st century medical care using a 19th century model of care. Large institutions were popular in 1918, but in 2018, we know smaller hospitals closer to home are far more effective for patients. Through a combination of options, we will be able to serve nearly all our civil patients in smaller facilities that are much closer to home and much more able to sustain the kinds of supports that ensure patients get the right care at the right time. And so um, over the so the governor has put forth a long-term vision to really transform our state behavioral health system from an institutional-based system of care to a community-based one. And there's been a number of things that have been put in place, particularly in the last legislative session, to do that, from additional community facilities, um, both civil commitment-based facilities, such as 16 and 14, 8, 48 bed facilities, um, expansion of facilities such as the new intensive behavioral health facility, um, creation of peer respite centers. Um, there's also was a fair amount of work done in with those individuals who have both mental illness and are involved with the criminal justice system through the True Blood Settlement, which creates a number of new diversion options, also creates a program of forensic navigators to help individuals who are with mental illness who are navigating the criminal justice system, um, as well as there was investments into a new behavioral health hospital at the UW campus, which will not only create additional bed capacity, but, but perhaps more importantly, given the crisis we're facing right now in workforce, will develop additional behavioral health workforce and will be part of its mission. So I really want to thank all of you for participating and joining the webinar today. I apologize that I won't be able to stay for the whole thing. Um, as Melody said, I am over here, um, actually over in the Senate building right now, So, and I'll have to get back to what I was doing. But um, this is a great opportunity for all of you to talk and to discuss the transformation that's going on. You've got a great presentation. 
a number of presentations that are coming up, and I really hope you have a wonderful, wonderful webinar, and thank you again for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Amber. We really greatly appreciate your time, and, and just a few housekeeping. Um, so this uh, webinar is being recorded, and we will be posting it on the Healthcare Authority website, thanks to um, Kennedy, who also helps us with our uh, IT and technology needs. Uh, we will be sending out also a copy of the webinar slides, um, and so and at this time we are not going to be taking questions. Um, so we do have a slide at the end that does provide uh, all of the contact information for all of the presenters or an uh, email box for folks to be able to send their questions in. So um, with that, we will turn it over to. Um, our first presenter, uh, Ken Taylor, from the Department of Social and Health Services Behavioral Health Administration. Uh, Tony, go ahead and do a few slides. Uh, keep going. Next slide. Next slide. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken Taylor. I'm an assistant. Well, I was an assistant secretary. Now I am a special assistant working for the secretary. Um, and I'm going to talk to you briefly today about what we have done over the last four months, which is really kind of amazing to me. Uh, we started down this journey in September of last year with a December 31st deadline. And I'm happy to say that we made that deadline. And I'm going to go through with you very briefly today some of the options that we considered in uh, placing or recommend, recommending citing to the legislature. So let's go to the next slide. So we are starting with an assumption um, that we were going to create 48 bed facilities, which is code for three 16-bed facilities, one of which is an evaluation and treatment center that I commonly refer to as an ENT. The second is a 90 slash 180-day facility, and the final one is a step-down. Um, the last two are, by definition, residential treatment facilities, but not in the traditional sense in that these are secure facilities, um, and it's an important distinction that we make because we are, uh, of course, trying to maximize federal participation in this program, and so in designing this, we create three 16-bed facilities, probably under one roof, although they could be three sort of freestanding cottages, if you will, sort of next to one another. DSHS would operate one of the facilities, and we will be looking for providers to operate the other two. We uh, have spent a lot of time in the car, up and down the I-5 corridor. I've gotten to know uh, everywhere from Clark County to Snohomish County pretty well over the last four months, and we'll move through some of our recommendations. So. Um, in addition to what uh, I'm going to spend most of the time talking about, we also are working on a possible new forensic hospital on Western State campus. Right now we are envisioning a 350-bed facility. We're just about to submit our 10-year plan to the city of Lakewood. That 10-year plan shows a proposed site for the new hospital. And if you're familiar with the area, it's at the sort of south end of the campus closest to the high school. That same 10-year plan shows a residential treatment facility at the north end closer to CSTC. Neither of those are decisions that have been made, but as part of a 10-year planning process, we identified to the city where we might locate facilities sometime, uh, sometime during the next decade. Next one, please. So I know um, I don't like to have people read slides to me, and so I'm not going to read my slides to you. 
And if you want to uh, review the pros and cons, not only with this option, but with other locations as well, I'll refer you to our slide deck where we detail um, the pros and cons that we identified for each of the six locations. In addition to Western State, we also started by examining other state-owned facilities and state properties thinking that that was going to create a, a more um, direct pathway for us to build and uh, open facilities. So we spent a lot of time at uh, the Fircrest School. Um, this is in the city of Shoreline, up in the northwest corner of the city of Seattle. The uh, city of Shoreline passed a six-month moratorium as we got into this process and decided that now we need to think about where might really be a good place for the kind of facilities you're describing. So um, that's off the table temporarily until that moratorium is lifted. Let's just keep, we just keep going through the uh, pros and cons because my 15 minutes is running out pretty fast here. Then we traveled out to Echo Glen. Um, you might uh, have heard of Echo Glen, or maybe not, uh, off of I-90. Um, kind of a nice, very wooded campus has been used primarily um, in the juvenile justice system for a long time. Um, one of the advantages that we saw about the Echo Glen site is that uh, they currently have a contract with the University of Washington to provide medical care there. And so maybe that leads to psychiatric care as well. Next slide. Um, the city of Arlington up in Snohomish County. Um, I had a chance to meet with um, mostly state elected senators and representatives and then drill down a little bit harder um, in terms of other potential sites, one of which turned out to be Arlington, not because um, we, the state of Washington, own any land there, but more because of um, the needs in the North Sound and its relative proximity to the city of Everett. We received a great welcome from the city of Arlington, which is uh, really uncharacteristic. Any of you who've ever done sighting know that uh, you're more often to uh, run into a buzzsaw of opposition than we found at Arlington where they showed us potential sites on a map and even introduced us to potential people who would sell us land. So it was an extraordinary um, visit with the city of our own. Next one, please, Tony. Um, in Clark County, um, we have identified a piece of property next to um, Columbia River Mental Health Center, which seems to be a good fit. Um, those of you who uh, live and work in Clark County know that uh, the, the ENT there closed in the fall. There are currently no ENT beds in Clark County. Um, and so this seems to us to be one of our uh, primary sites to look at. 15 minutes goes by pretty fast. <laughs> um, next site that we looked at was in um, South Thurston County, right on the Lewis County line. In fact, it's Maple Lane, also a former juvenile justice facility, now being used by DOC and CSHS for some forensic services. So that's a possibility as well. Because you're doing a great job. Other locations that I just uh, rambled through very quickly for you, the one that we prefer um, is the Southwest Washington site next to Columbia River Mental Health Center. We, as they just do not get to decide, the legislature decides, and more specifically, the capital committees of the legislature will decide. And so we put forth our recommendation. They have a report from us um, which you've just gotten the five-minute encapsulated version of. And we're hoping to have uh, some conversations and some hearings with the capital committees over the next uh, couple of months, and perhaps a decision is made. We have $20 million in capital currently for a 48-bed for a facility, 
and we have five million dollars currently for a 16 bed facility. Neither amount is sufficient to actually complete the project, um, but we consider it an important down payment. In the slide deck, uh, we lay out for you what a typical schedule would look like. In all probability, we, um, if this goes forward as we hope, we're probably the better part of three years out before we could actually have a patient or a resident in any of the facilities. If you want to read the uh, full report, we've provided the link to the report so you can see that. And um, one more slide, please. And then we also have um, an email box set up so that you can email us questions. Uh, we haven't talked at all about it, and I'm kind of over time, so I won't spend any time on it. But we're also um, working with our friends here at HCA to promote an anti-stigma campaign, and we're going to do that um, in targeted areas that will coincide with the locations that you just saw. So I want to thank you all for your uh, time on a Friday afternoon before a three-day weekend, and give it back to my friend Melody. Thank you, Ken, so much for this great information. Um, our next presenters are from Aging and Long-Term Care Services Administration um, at the Department of Social and Health Services, so I will turn it over to you. Um, Candy and B, and uh, ask you uh, if you would like us to advance the slides, please go ahead and say next slide so that our, our um, uh, faithful administrative assistant can help do that. So thank you, um, Candice and B, for joining us this afternoon and sharing your information and what your projects are, are uh, doing and happening with the uh, governor's plan. Great, so this is Bea Rector, and I am the Director of Home and Community Services Division at Aging and Long-Term Support Administration. And Candy and I are going to split up these slides, so I'll do the first part of the presentation, and Candy will do the second. Um, so Aging, and just go ahead and advance to the next slide, please. Aging and Long-Term Support Administration's mission is to transform lives by promoting choice, independence, and safety through innovative services. We support a broad range of clients, uh, ages 18 to death, uh, with a diverse set of needs. And the services that we provide are not based on someone's particular diagnosis. They're based on their level of functioning with the ability to perform what is called activities of daily living. Those are things like bathing, dressing, walking, and medication management. So the individuals that we're talking about today are individuals with functional impairments, um, largely due to mental health conditions uh, where they may uh, benefit from cueing and supervision of those daily activities, but they also often have other conditions like diabetes or heart disease uh, like, like many of us do. So um, what Home and Community Services Division does is implement the mission by working with those individuals, their families, caregivers, communities and advocates to assist individuals who need to access those services. We do assessment and service planning and provide case management under Medicaid to over 68,000 people a month. And then the Residential Care Services Division implements our mission through ensuring quality care um, through the licensing, oversight, regulation, and complaint resolution um, and they support over 70,000 individuals who are living in 3,600 licensed and certified uh, residential settings in Washington State. Next slide. So again, we really want to focus on a subset of individuals that we work with here at Aging and Long-Term Support Administration who are either discharging from or diverting from state psychiatric hospitals to community-based long-term care settings. Um, individuals receiving services in the state psychiatric hospitals typically have a serious mental illness, which is defined as a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder resulting in serious functional impairment, which substantially interferes or limits uh, major life activities. And again, um, that could be things like being able to bathe, um, walk, dress, um, take care of personal hygiene, or taking medications. 
Um, one in 25 people in America, or 5% almost of the population, experience a serious mental illness. Uh, the prevalence is higher in women and young adults. Most adults with serious mental illness live in their own homes with family and friends, and that's true in our service delivery system as well. Some benefit from more structured living settings and may need paid caregivers to assist them. And, um, and if that's the case, then we have settings to provide that kind of 24-7 um, assistance with activities of daily living. Next slide. It's very important to aging and long-term support administration that we work across the systems of care as we work with individuals in hospitals who no longer meet medical necessity criteria for being in that hospital setting. Um, we get a lot of questions about kind of the steps it takes to assist somebody who has been identified by the hospital as being stable and no longer in need of being in that setting uh, to what it takes to help support them and create a service plan for community living. So just quickly, uh, we get a referral from the hospital. We review any barriers, um, things like decision-making capacity, identification barriers to being able to qualify for Medicaid, barriers to being able to do that community transition. We review both current and any history of behaviors, um, and that's just part of risk assessment. Certainly some, some individuals have more complex needs and need um, more supports than others, and so we wanna make sure we have a good understanding of that and really take a comprehensive approach to ensure that somebody will be successful in the community. We uh, determine eligibility for the Medicaid long-term care. We perform assessment and work with the hospital staff and also um, manage care organizations and, and um, behavioral health organizations to create that comprehensive plan of care. In our system, it's really important that client choice is identified. Where do they want to live? Where do they see themselves being most successful? Where are they going to get the support um, that they need? And so we work through that choice the individual is making. Um, oftentimes, the provider who has been identified in the community will come to the hospital and meet with the individual who's transitioning. Um, Again, just to kind of make sure that that's going to be a good match. Um, if there's any concerns associated with that transition, uh, we will address those. Referrals are made with the mental health system to get the right wraparound services, the mental health treatment services that might be needed. Um, and then a transition date is determined and confirmed, and that transition happens, and then um, ongoing case management either is done by Home and Community Services Division for people living in licensed residential settings or by area agencies on aging for folks moving to their own home. Next slide, please. We do have a continuum of settings that have been developed over several decades that provide varying levels of service and choice to individuals who need uh, those daily living tasks assistance. Settings are designed to serve individuals with both low and high reliance on others for assistance. Uh, there are providers in each of these settings who have made investments um, with the appropriations made through the governor's budget and ultimately the conference budget to really better understand the needs of individuals um, who are uh, coming out of the state hospitals who may have complex behavioral health needs. and. Um, each of these settings is playing a role currently in serving individuals who are discharging or diverting from state hospitals. Our newest facility type um, is specifically developed to serve individuals who need assistance with personal care, who have complex behavioral health needs, and really benefit from um, a low staff to resident <laughs> ratio of one to four, have on-site behavioral um, health support as well as uh, on-site nursing, and that is an enhanced services facilities. We currently have four of those providers with a total of 52 beds, um, and we have a number of providers that are in varying levels of a process of developing a new enhanced services facility. I will say that um, siting, as Ken talked about earlier, has been a challenge for those providers. 
Um, and we have done uh, a lot of education between residential care services and home and community services to really educate people that all of the settings you see um, on the screen are long-term care settings. Um, they're settings that people are able to leave and, and access the community as they need to. Um, there are facilities that are going to support people kind of functioning at the highest level of capability that they have and are really designed around um, more of a long-term care um, kind of service delivery model and not they are not mental health providers. So next slide. This really shows you um, where people are relocating to um, after they discharge from Western and Eastern State Hospital. So this actually shows you from the previous biennium, which began July 1 of 2017 and ended in June of uh, 2019. And you will see that there's some differences between um, the number one setting and number three setting between Western and Eastern, but overall, the top five settings are the same. Individuals are going into adult family homes and assisted living facilities, um, into the few 52 beds of enhanced services facilities that we currently have operating, um, and many going into their own home, either with personal care assistance or personal care assistance and also supportive housing wrapped around them with a few going into skilled nursing facilities. So we moved 579 people in the 1719 biennium. We are targeted to try to assist 640 individuals in this biennium that began uh, July 1 of 2019. And we also began diversionary activities uh, this biennium as well. So if somebody is detained in a community psychiatric hospital bed, and the hospital uh, determines that they are stable enough to be able to go directly from that community hospital out to a long-term care setting with mental health services access in the community. Um, we, we do that and we're averaging about 10 people uh, per month that are diverting from um, Eastern and Western State Hospital. Next slide, and I'm going to pass it on to yeah. Candy. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Candy Gehring, and I'm the Director of Residential Care Services for the Aging and Long-Term Support Administration. And we have given us an overview of the uh, work that Home and Community Services does um, to help secure the resources in the community, um, the care planning, and the uh, support for individuals to transition out of our state hospital or other inpatient care settings to um, be successful living in the community. And, and I wanted to lend some insight about the residential care services role in this work. And we're really fortunate that across our divisions, um, we've been able to build a, a model of, of support for not only the, the person with a serious mental illness um, to support them where they want to live in the community, but also for the residential providers. And, and safety is always a priority for the department, but also for the individual who will be living in the community. So we want to be sure that, that we have built a really quality network of care options for people. So uh, both within home and community services and residential care services, we have been fortunate to be able to bring on staff with mental health, behavioral health expertise. So both of our divisions are providing excuse me, providing training and technical assistance for the adult family home, assisted living, um, nursing home providers, uh, and their staff. And we can do this um, either specifically focused on a, an individual who may bring some special care needs along with them or around a topic related to care. For example, restraints can be used in a hospital setting, but they cannot be used in a community-based setting. And so we talked with the provider about that transition and, mm -hmm. and how to anticipate the kind of care that they need, what wraparound services might be available to them, um, and try to make them understand that while that kind of care might have been very appropriate and provided in the hospital, our regulations in our residential care uh, settings are very different. Home and Community Services has also been developing specialty contracts 
to care for people, and that brings additional training. It brings additional resources from those wraparound services that we described, um, and also a special rate depending upon the, the kind of specialty care that an individual uh, might need. We're also doing consultations before people are discharged from the hospital. So again, Home and Community does it from a care planning assessment perspective, and we do it from a regulatory perspective. What we want to do is to change the, the dialogue and, and sort of destigmatize again, as Ken has had referred to in his presentation, so people aren't, providers aren't afraid to take people into their residential care setting and be concerned about their safety or their ability to be in compliance with the regulation. So we're all providing coordination with the behavioral health system. We're responding to concerns about allegations of abuse, neglect, abandonment, and exploitation. And residential care services does that, as well as our adult protective services. So we really built a, a comprehensive system of care across our division here at Aging and Long-Term Support Administration. Next slide, please. So for some of you who may not be at all familiar with residential care services, our purpose is to promote and protect the rights, security, and the well-being of individuals living in licensed or certified residential settings. So adult protective services, which may be more familiar to you, um, does investigations um, related to abuse, neglect, and misappropriation of funds for individuals who uh, may have had um, that abuse or neglect from another individual. Our focus is on the failed practice within a facility or the compliance um, of a facility with their regulations. So while we have a focus on the facility, all of that work is done to assure that people are receiving the care and services that they need. So we have partnerships with um, many community representatives. We work with family members and providers, all working towards the benefit of that individual. We do have a regulatory system that promotes positive outcomes, and a culture that really values um, the benefit of our GSHS mission, which is transforming lives. And so we're really fortunate to have built up an environment um, that has nurses and allied health professionals who are providing that regulatory work and supporting our behavioral health um, mission that we're working on right now. Next slide, please. So our behavioral health support team has been um, being built over the last couple of years. So we definitely identified when the governor um, first established his mental health transformation initiative that a great deal of, of investment needed to be made in the assessment and, and case planning and, and discharge work for individuals transforming out of, uh, transitioning out of the hospital. But we also needed to be sure that we had a really strong provider network. So we did receive additional funding to increase our community alternative options that provided for that transition. So we have developed a behavioral health support team with residential care services. And this actually allows us to, to provide consultative services within a regulatory environment. So any of you on this webinar who are familiar with either individuals from Department of Health or residential care services coming in, we're, we're typically not there in a consultative role. We're typically there in a role to assure that a facility is in compliance with regulation. But we were able to develop a team that's separate from our regulatory function who can come in, as I said, prior to discharge or while a resident has been in the community for any period of time, really, and give a consultation to that provider. We also have um, a training specialist an outcome improvement specialist, and a policy specialist so that we can look across all of the different um, scope of work that we do at residential care services to make sure that we're getting prepared to regulate the delivery of uh, mental health services in our community-based settings in the 21st century. Because we know some of our policies are outdated and we need to be sure that we're keeping current with the needs of our community. Next slide. So here are our goals for you to, to think about and um, and think about how the team goals that we're putting in place also support the work that many of you are probably direct caregiving as well um, to people in the wraparound services that being described. 
So our, our team goals across our divisions are to support the success for those transitioning to a new living arrangement. And we know many of these individuals, when they come um, into the community, have been in the hospital for 10 or 20 years. So it's a big change for them to come into a very different living uh, environment. We want the um, transitions to be successful long term so that people um, find a forever home in the community. And if they can transition to lower levels of care, those are available to them. And likewise, if they need higher levels of care, those are available to them without them having to go back into the state hospital. We want success for our providers within a regulatory structure, so they feel confident that they are providing care within that regulatory set um, and still meeting the complex needs of people in a person-centered approach. All about coordination, um, our team are talking to each other every day on a number of different issues to make sure that, that we're coordinating um, those transitions and identifying the needs of the providers and of our residents. And then also working in a proactive mode to train people and provide education support so they can be successful. And so I think we actually have had some um, good stories shared with us by providers from the Residential Care Services side. Um, they have told our staff things such as, I was getting ready to discharge this person because I didn't think I could care for them. And then with the support they got from case management and from uh, uh, Residential Care Services, they feel like they can provide quality care for someone and they end up not discharging them. And then in really successful cases, they've identified for us that the tools that we taught them, they've been able to apply to other residents or think about other admissions into their facilities. So I think our work is also um, absolutely proactive in helping people then transfer that knowledge and that learning um, to the next individual that might need it. Next slide. Okay, I think B is going to finish up with us on the on the funding. So uh, what this slide shows you is that for the biennium we're currently in, beginning July 1, 2019, and we'll end 30, 2021, there was a significant investment um, made by the legislature uh, in really building the infrastructure, building the staffing um, and the provider specialty necessary to really successfully help people who are transitioning from the state hospitals to be successful and live long periods of time out in the community. So what you'll see here is um, the dollar amount appropriated and our best projection in terms of uh, where those dollars will be spent. So there certainly is um, an expectation that we will be able to get new enhanced services facilities up and running um, in this biennium. And there are a number of those facilities that providers are in different um, areas of development. Um, but they are, it is a slow development process. So we are funded for an additional 94 beds on top of the 52 that we currently um, have. And one of the things we've learned about our enhanced services facilities is that um, there is very little churn once people transition. They really are able to stay for a long periods of time in the enhanced services facility. Um, the average length of stay is almost 20 months. Um, which is uh, really consistent with kind of average length of stay in our in all of our settings. Uh, what we have learned is that the incidence of dementia um, is certainly growing in our communities, but as people uh, live longer with serious mental illness, they have the same age-related issues that the rest of the population has. So the prevalence of people who have both a serious mental illness and dementia is growing. And so there has been an investment both on the capital side as well as on the service side to try to increase um, access and the number of beds that are available to people uh, with dementia transitioning from the hospital. Uh, supportive housing is um, incredibly important because most people coming out of the state hospital um, also would like to live independently in their own apartments. And, but they often need additional support both finding that housing and also being able to retain that housing once they find it. Um, and supported 
housing helps them do that and often will have personal care services authorized alongside that supportive housing assistance. Um, people moving into our typical residential settings also will continue. And then you'll see the staffing um, that we've talked a lot about this afternoon in terms of those, um, those behavioral health consultants, the trainers, the additional case management. The one thing I do want to highlight is the last thing on this slide, which is online training. And one of the things that we've heard a lot from our providers is it's great to have the consultation, it's great to have the classroom training, but given the 24-7 nature and also just the turnover of direct care workers, they would like to see access on an online system to some real-time training. Um, and so we we were able to get that funded in this biennium and we are in the process of standing up a pilot for a learning management system that would be available to our providers um, and identifying curriculum. We're actually going through a stakeholder process with them now to identify curriculum to load. So that that completes our side of the presentation. Candy B, thank you all both so much for your time today and sharing all of the great information and resources from Aging and Long-Term Care Services Administration. We're going to turn it over to Terry Waterland, the Director of the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery at the Healthcare Authority. So really briefly, I'm just going to go into some high-level stuff about Healthcare Authority and DBHR, and then I will kick it back over to Melody to talk about some of our specific projects. But um, healthcare Authority, for those of you that have not worked for us um, before or have the, the opportunity to work with us before, Healthcare Authority is committed to whole person care and integrating physical health and behavioral health. Um, we really believe that integrating um, behavioral health and physical health is uh, going to lead to better results and healthier residents of Washington State. Um, we serve behavioral health and recovery needs through, and you can see this on your slide, but really four different kind of uh, avenues, which is prevention, intervention, which includes early intervention, inpatient and outpatient treatment, and then recovery support services. Next slide, thank you. And then about the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery, um, we really are uh, aimed at uh, being focused on a few different things. Behavioral health is made up of uh, substance use disorders, mental health, and also problem gambling. Um, and uh, we really focus on those things. We also do a lot of population-based services, crisis line, crisis services, um, and we focus on providing services and support to individuals, contractors, providers in the community, as well as NCOs and BHASOs, uh, so that they can provide the best quality services to Washingtonians who need um, any sort of behavioral health support or intervention. And with that, Melody, I think folks really want to hear about some of the cool projects that are going on. Thank you, Carrie. There are um, about eight, uh, six different distinct projects that were included in the governor's plan um, that the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery and our partners at MCOs and, and providers um, and BHASOs are um, doing to launch. And so one of those uh, six projects is expanding our programs, uh, projects for us Assertive Community Treatment, Progress for Assertive Community Treatment. I try, I realize I have a lot of acronyms in the slides. Um, and so PAC, our multidisciplinary team that are really um, originally thought of as hospitals without walls that provide very intensive support to individuals um, that without that support might be in higher level institutional settings. Uh, and so funding is provided for eight PAC teams throughout the state, um, five full teams and um, two half teams. And so this year in state fiscal year 20, we did an RFP for three full teams and two half teams, and that's still in process. Um, the RFP re has been released and uh, apparent successful bidders are in the process of being announced. Um, so that, um, that process of those RFPs and, and getting those funds out for those multidisciplinary teams um, is in process. Another project within the governor's plan that the Healthcare Authority and the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery and its partners at Aging and Long-Term Care Services Administration is working on is providing intensive residential treatment teams for those folks that are in adult family homes, 
um, or assisted living facilities that need more um, intensive support um, than uh, with a multidisciplinary team. Um, so we designed in partnership with ALSA the idea of intensive residential treatment teams that could go and provide um, psychiatric support to individuals in those settings. And so uh, a request for proposals was released for the fiscal year 20 funds for those four teams. And we are in the process of um, looking at a, a parent successful bidders as well as surveying um, for additional um, teams to be able to launch these new resources and services across the state. Next slide. Another um, project within the um, governor's plan was this idea of doing a mental health drop-in center. Uh, and so in House Bill 1394, it describes this uh, pilot um, that's going to be uh, in the largest city in a regional service area that has at least nine counties, uh, which would be Greater Columbia and would be most likely the Yakima. Uh, and so the, that is actually language out of the bill. Uh, and so uh, essentially we're um, looking and working with the region, the Behavioral Health Administrative Service Organization and the provider in, providers in that community to talk about what that pilot looks like um, and really focusing on serving individuals um, with peers as well as um, meeting their uh, acute psychiatric needs. And so this is going to really be a pilot and we'll learn a lot from this new mental health drop-in center. Uh, and so we are working and, and looking at trying to develop that in the region. The next project, next slide, um, are peer respites. And I can't be more excited about these new services in Washington State. Washington has been a leader across the country on implementing peer services. And so this is really an opportunity of having peer, peer run, peer operate, operated um, centers have a place for individuals that are in a psychiatric distress. They may not be in full crisis but being able to identify that they need some additional support and being able to provide those peer support services within a setting and letting that person, you know, have a respite within this setting. And so this is really um, a new model in Washington State. There are um, precedents around the country. There's many, many, many uh, of these peer respites across the country and we're working closely with the National Technical Assistance um, to really flush out what this model looks like in Washington um, so that we're really following the pure peer model and making sure that it's peer run, peer operated, working closely with the communities on, on how people are referred and how we are able to support these new services in Washington. So um, this, these funds um, do not start until July of 2020 and so gives us time to really do a lot of stakeholdering. Our lead Jennifer Bliss, um, the program manager for the Office of Consumer Partnerships or uh, Recovery Partnerships, yep. um, are really doing a lot of stakeholder and getting a lot of community feedback on what this program should look like. And so um, we'll certainly connect folks to that as we learn more about this. We're also working very closely with the Department of Health on the rulemaking as well as our partners at the Department of Commerce. Um, who actually provided the funds for us to be able to reach out to the National Technical Assistance. Next slide. Uh, another um, also very uh, new program that the Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery is looking at uh, developing, and this again is in partnership with our Department of Health and Department of Commerce partners, um, because this is a brand new facility type. Um, so this are, these are behavioral health intensive facilities, and these are really intended for individuals that um, have acute psychiatric needs but maybe do not have the um, challenges with their activities of daily living that the um, folks are partnered at Aging and Long-Term Care Service Administration talked about for the enhanced service facilities. So there's a difference between their, the enhanced service facilities and the behavioral health intensive facilities where for these facilities, individuals um, would still would have to be able to meet their adult daily living needs activities. Um, and so uh, th that is also a new program we're working very closely with Department of Commerce on as well as DOH on the rules. 
the last um, next slide is our expanding our capacity for 90, 180 day beds. Um, so as we work on transitioning individuals with um, civil commitments in the state hospitals, um, we need to be able to have the community capacity for those civil beds. And so um, Margo Miller, our lead on this project, is working closely with hospitals and freestanding ENTs to bring them under contract um, with the Healthcare Authority's Division of Behavioral Health and Recovery um, for these um, beds. And so uh, we're actively recruiting and creating the additional capacity so that we can um, really truly uh, have individuals under civil commitment in their local community um, so that their friends and families can come visit them within those settings. They can be connected upon their discharge um, in their community. And so this is really um, one of those projects that is so directly related to what what Amber talked about in the governor's quote about keeping people in their local community. And so um, this is really about the contracts, but um, really I know Matt, who's going to be our next presenter, is going to talk a little bit about the capital funds and how we're braiding all of these resources together, the operations funds, as well as the capital funds and being able to work in partnership with our local communities, hospitals, and freestanding uh, ENTs. Um, so we are working on a communications plan with um, Kennedy and, and our uh, communications team, as well as a toolkit, because this is so new in, in our state to look at what these, um, this community capacity looks like, how the uh, hospital works with the court system, how we transport individuals back and forth, how we, what does programming look like now in uh, a 90, 180-day facility in the community. And so those are all going to be parts of a toolkit that we're working on, again, thanks to the Department of Commerce for the national technical assistance that they've provided to help us do that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Matt from Department of Commerce and, and sharing our last presentation on the capital funds for all of the projects that have been listed today. Great. Thank you very much, Melody. Hi everyone, this is Matt Mazerhart from the Department of Commerce, and as Melody mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about Commerce's role in funding behavioral health facilities. As we've heard throughout the webinar today, the governor's plan focuses around transitioning and diverting people from the state psychiatric hospitals to community facilities. And Commerce's role is to help create a physical uh, facility space through new construction and renovation to increase our state's physical capacity for serving people with behavioral health needs. So Commerce provides grants for construction. We do not provide grants for operations. On the screen here, we have some key eligibility considerations for our facilities grants. We also have our program guidelines on our website, which details more of our eligibility requirements. I'll note a couple up on the screen. Uh, we require that services be provided in all funded facilities for at least 15 years and grantees must commit to serving publicly funded patients and persons detained under the Involuntary Treatment Act. Here's a snapshot of the appropriation amounts that Commerce has received for facility funding in the last four bienniums. The first real uh, comprehensive investment in behavioral health facilities was in 2017-2019, and that uh, increased even more in the most recent capital budget, allowing us to fund more facility types and a wider variety of facility types, which we'll get into here in a second. Here's a snapshot of what Commerce receives in the most recent capital budget. We've talked a little bit today about enhanced service facilities. We recently completed our funding round for enhanced service facilities and funded a project in 
Spokane Valley for $2 million and one in Olympia for $2 million. And we also received money for services for persons with uh, dementia who are exiting or um, being diverted from the state hospitals, as well as money for 90 to 180 day civil commitment facilities. And then the two uh, newer project types that Melody touched on, uh, money for peer respite centers and money for intensive behavioral health treatment facilities, which we're also very excited about and will include in our next funding round, which we'll talk about here in a second. We're going to open that funding round in the spring of this year, probably late February or March. We're going to be looking for applications for facilities in the following five categories there up on the screen. And we have a link there to our website. We encourage folks to check that out if you're at all interested. We'll have our program guidelines up there soon. You can look at our program guidelines from our last funding round. Um, but we have more information and there's also a link where you can sign up and get email updates from us. So you'll get a, a email blast when we have our funding round open and you'll get an email blast when we have any other pertinent information uh, go up on our website. So we're working on those applications now and excited to have those out soon. And with that, I will turn it back over to Melody. Thank you, Matt, so much for this information. Um, you know, just to wrap up our webinar today, this the webinar, and I just can't thank our sister agencies enough for their time today and sharing information about their projects associated with the governor's plan. Um, go to ahead and go to the next slide. But if folks are interested in contacting any of the presenters or finding out any um, additional information about the project or the information presented today, here are the contact uh, email addresses for the folks. Um, and so we really, again, appreciate all of the time. We did not take questions today because we really wanted this to be just more information sharing about all of the projects in the governor's plan and where all of our city agencies are at with implementing those projects. But certainly we know that this, this presentation may have generated a lot of those questions. And so please feel free to reach out to the contact folks um, above for, for more detailed information or questions about any of the projects. I've also uploaded the handout, the PowerPoint, um, to the uh, GoTo uh, webinar menu. And so if you'd like to download um, the webinar uh, PowerPoint, please feel free to do so. We also will, um, since we recorded this webinar today, we will be posting that um, as well as distributing the uh, PowerPoint to those folks registered. So thank you all so much again for your time today. We are at three o'clock. Have a wonderful weekend and thank you all again so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.